The next item in the order paper is a motion on a public inquiry into Muckamore Abbey Hospital. Clerk, please read the motion. That this assembly calls on the Minister of Health to establish a public inquiry under the terms of the Inquiries Act 2005 into Muckamore Abbey Hospital in support of the families of residents who have campaigned for justice and, in the interim, further calls on the Minister of Health to progress urgently the recommendations of the recent review of leadership and governance at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. I call Paula Bradshaw to formally move the motion. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and, and thank you, Minister, for joining us in the Chamber today. I rise... Sorry. Uh, I'm asking you to formally move the motion. Oh, I formally move the motion. Sorry. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and uh, is published on the Marshall list. Before we begin, I want to advise mem members of the need to take care of their contributions today. I'm sure that you all will be aware that there have been a number of arrests related to alleged offences at Muckermorn Abbey Hospital. I do not want to inhibit discussions on the motion, which clearly relates to a matter of public interest. But in accordance with my responsibility under Standing Order 73, I caution members to be particularly careful that they say nothing in their contribution in today's debate that might prejudice the outcomes of the criminal proceedings, a very serious responsibility. Members who deliberately flout the subjudice rule will be asked to resume their seat. I now invite you to uh, open the debate. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you, Minister, for being here. I rise to propose this motion, not on my behalf nor on behalf of the Alliance Party, but on behalf of the parents and loved ones who have campaigned for many years for a public inquiry into Muckamore Abbey Hospital in their quest for truth and justice. And as such, I would like to pay tribute to the families whose dedication and determination has brought us thus far. This is an extraordinarily difficult and sensitive issue, as the Speaker has pointed out. We cannot applaud enough their efforts to get us this far. In her review of safeguarding at Muckamore, Dr Margaret Flynn stated, our overarching observation is Muckamore Abbey Hospital is a high-risk setting. There are high risks for patients who are placed there. We think of hospitals as, as healing environments, as places where we stay for a limited period and then we are discharged. This is not the experience of patients at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. This motion is clearly about an inquiry into what turned Muckamore into a high-risk setting rather than a healing environment. But it is even more fundamental than that. In supporting the motion, I am asking MLAs here today to make a commitment to never again place vulnerable people in high-risk settings. Therefore, this motion is not about sorry, bricks and mortar. It is not even about one particular location. It is fundamentally about how we care for vulnerable patients and how we ensure and commit to their loved ones that they are being cared for appropriately. It is very clear from what the families themselves say and from the various reviews and reports over the years that Muckamore was felt to be a place out of sight, out of mind. Some cases of the denial of information about the care of family members, in particular about serious incidences, were and are extremely alarming. And it could take families days to be informed about these incidents and it could and can still take years for complaints to be properly investigated. This Assembly must commit to never allowing this situation to develop again. So let's look at the background. Professor Roy McClelland, um, Chair of the Bamford Review, has warned that what we have heard about Muckamore, particularly in the last, last three days, sorry, years or so, constitute systematic failings requiring a full inquiry. And he also warned that these may just be the tip of the iceberg. This re-emphasises that an inquiry is not just about ensuring justice, although that is essential, but it is also about enabling us to take urgent action to ensure such a situation never occurs again. The most urgent action is that now we move to implement the conclusions of the review of leadership and governance and the safeguarding report. The latter, of course, requires the closure of Muckamore Abbey Hospital. 
On top of that, however, we must ensure that never again we see any place of care within our health and social care system becoming so peripheral that the highest standards of leadership and governance are simply not implemented there. Muckamore was once seen as a model for good, good delivery, but that was many dec decades ago. Already in the mid-1990s, focus in public policy and academic research was shifting towards community care rather than the outdated concepts of institutions. From October 2002, we saw the publication and implementation of at least some aspects of the Bamford Review on Mental Health and Learning Disability. This included the relocation of children's services and a more general emphasis on moving on from Muckamore as it, is, as it was at that time. It was in November 2012 that two staff members were charged with assault for abuse in the Ennis Ward. The fact that, this, that the subsequent report was not acted upon is one reason why families will, with some justification, accept nothing less now that other than a full and transparent public inquiry. Years after the Ennis report, CCTV was finally installed in two wards at Muckamore, but no policy was put in place to finalise its use. Nevertheless, we then heard about the CCTV um, footage and the um, subsequent introduction of the police looking at that, and we know that that's ongoing and I respect the, the, um, that, that process. But we know that because there was no policy in place, it is evidence of too great a distance between the operation of the hospital and the management of it. And again, we have heard of many arrests and suspensions for alleged abuse over the years, so we'll not go into that. But in December 2018, um, Dr Margaret Flynn's out, um, report outlined failings, including a lack of safeguarding protocols, harming of patients and use of unmonitored seclusion room. She made public her view that the hospital had to close. Resettlement of those at Muckamore was promised, but remains incomplete. This report was leaked rather than published. This lack of transparency is one reason why the Alliance Party and others made clear their view at that time that a public inquiry would only suffice. It was later even than that that the RQIA took action against the Trust regarding standards of care. It is unclear why it took so long. Mr Speaker, it, this is a deeply alarming litany of adverse incidents poor governance and, most importantly, alleged harm caused to vulnerable people. Go ahead. I mean, I accept everything the member has said in terms of opening remarks, but the member also accept there's responsibility on politicians as well. Whenever Muckleboard did go to lengths to actually rehabilitate these people and get them into the community, that people reacted in a very adverse manner, where I see left the trust on the back foot and some of these people were actually kept longer than it actually should be because politicians rejected them in the, within some communities. That was possibly before my time as a full-time politician, but I, I'll, I'll note your remarks. Um, when simply put on the record like that, it's unsure why we haven't had a public inquiry to date. As I mentioned, a review of leadership and governance was carried out earlier this year, and it does provide recommendations for immediate implementation. The culture of resolving matters on site rather than enabling challenge at board level regarding discharge of statutory functions, the lack of clear direction in any sense from broad, broad sorry, board management right through even to plans for the future of the site, and the fundamental failure to implement governance and leadership arrangements are clearly defined problems which need to be rectified. On top of this, we see that our regulation simply, sorry, regulation system simply does not work. The entire system of oversight, but not actual regulation of Muckamore by RQIA is a nonsense. There needs to be a specific regulation on mental health and learning disability sim services similar to that carried out by the Care Quality Commission in England. We should have already seen a review of staffing, both numbers and training, if we are to become increasingly reliant on daycare for the patients. And we should have had a comprehensive package of emotional support for the families of those who have suffered at Muckamore already in place. The Minister has referred in the past and indeed at the most recent health committee that he has met with the families. The families are very clear what they want and indeed have demanded a full public inquiry under the 2005 Inquiries Act. Indeed, when they made this clear, um, I think it was around 2018, the Minister himself in his previous role as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, signed up to support one himself. There is no harm in the Minister continuing in this role now and engaging with the families, but he must know what is required. 
Now it is about getting on with what he signed up to. Endless delays mainly suggest people are trying to hide something, but what we need is absolute transparency. A public inquiry specifically is required to meet the family's justifiable demands and address their concerns. To compel witnesses, and we have seen recently in the review of leadership and governance that not everybody who should have partook part in that because we need to get the answers, we need to get the information from the people who were there and who were responsible. But before I draw my remarks to a close, Mr Speaker, I do want to acknowledge that there have been and still are many fine employees of Muckamore who have provided health and wellbeing support to the patients with professionalism and integrity. A public inquiry would separate out those who did wrong from those who did right by the patients. We owe it to them to provide a mechanism for marking out this distinction. So, in conclusion, this motion is not just about a public inquiry, but about meaningful, meaningful change emerging from such an inquiry. This is about justice for families past and future. It is about transparency about what went on historically, but it is also a call to action to improve meaningfully and permanently the experience of people with mental health problems, learning disabilities and autism in the future. Those in care and their families must, must always be assured, regardless of what form that care takes, that they are being looked after properly, with appropriate safeguards and leadership in place. I will be supporting the Sinn Féin Amendment, and I commend this motion to the House. Thank you. I call on Colin Gildernew to move the amendment. I move the amendment. Thank you. The Speaker will have ten minutes to speak on the amendment and a further five minutes to wind. All other speakers during this debate will have five minutes. I now invite you to open the debate on the amendment. Um, I want to start today by firstly thanking the movers of the motion. It's a, an extremely important motion, um, probably one of, one of the more important things that, that we have discussed. And I would like to thank uh, the members, uh, Paula and John, who have brought the motion here today. I also would like to thank the press and legal teams who have supported families throughout this. But I do call into question why that has become necessary, where families are struggling to get answers in relation to care that has been provided by a, a health care system. Um, I think, in the first instance, health care should be providing that support on an ongoing basis. One of the first meetings that I did after I became an MLA was in Belfast City Hall, with a, and, and I met with some of the family members. I met with Glyn Brown, Catherine Fox, and I was absolutely rocked, I have to say, at the impact of what had happened here on those families. It was, it was horrendous. There's, there's no, there's no, I, 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 was, I was totally taken aback. I was also deeply impressed by their stoicism, by their dignity, and by their quiet determination to protect their loved ones and to get answers to what had happened here. I then engaged in, an, in, a, in a series of meetings, and, and along with party colleagues, a series of meetings with a series of organisations, and I, I started to get a flavour of what the families were dealing with in terms of trying to get information. And bear in mind, throughout this, there were times when families had to put in freedom of information requests to get basic information in relation to what had happened. I met with the Belfast, Belfast Health and Social Care Trust on numerous occasions. I met with the PSNA on multiple occasions, the PPS. The Human Rights Commission, um, sectoral groups, the Safeguarding Board, we met with MENCAP, we met with Positive Futures, they were all of a, of a one mind. First of all, the issues had to be addressed and that the people who were being cured for in Muckamore deserved better. And they deserve answers and they deserve improvements. Um, I also visited Muckamore and I have to say I was struck. At, it is a challenging environment. There's no doubt about it. I actually then felt all over again for families because the very idea that you would have to um, put your son or daughter in a, into any, when they are so vulnerable, into any of these facilities is, is bad enough. Um, and despite, despite the efforts of staff, Muckamore is a difficult environment. Um, and you know, I was in the seclusion rooms. Those are those are. Those are really, really would, would when you see the starkness of that setting. And I also observed to, what to me seemed to be a lack of, of 
uh, facilities to train and prepare people for more independent living. And that, that struck me as well. But I think it's important that we, that we recognise that. Pat Sheehan, my colleague, has also met with staff, and we recognise that staff here are working in a very, very challenging environment, and the staff have struggled to maintain the high levels of care. There's been huge amounts of reliance on agency staff, and while they also do a good job, it, it stands in the way of developing the relationships which are so needed. So I believe that a public inquiry is absolutely needed here. I think that all parties within this chamber actually agree with that as well. Um, it is a stated Ardash policy for, for Sinn Féin, and I know, Minister, that you also agree that a public inquiry is needed because of the extent and the gravity of what has happened here in Muckamore. And what, what has compounded that difficulty is the fact that some of the worst abuse in this was, was piled upon people who are some of our most vulnerable, people who cannot even speak for themselves. So that places a duty on every one of us, on the healthcare system, on us, on everybody, to speak on their behalf. Families have been carrying that burden for too long now to try to speak out um, and to try to deal with it. There have been issues with governance and accountability within the health, health and social care wor world, and I don't think it's acceptable to just blame ward and hospital management level. I think we need to look at the structures right up, right up through the, the piece. There have been already multiple reports into Muckamore. We've had the serious adverse incident by Margaret Flynn, who I met in Muckamore. Um, we have had the, the leadership review, and we have had a series of other reports, Bamford and calling for change of services, and, and that, that recognition is there of how this, needs to, how this needs to be developed. We need absolutely to find out why there were failings in terms of providing learning disability workers here of our own, who we could develop as, as valuable staff, and who the people in Muckamore could develop meaningful relationships with in terms of, of staff relationships. There has been a, a significant amount of staff who have been suspended. There are, there are obviously arrests ongoing, and that is all uh, appropriate. And, and whenever I have spoke to the other agencies, they have all said that it is possible to conduct a public inquiry and allow any police or criminal investigations to continue. Uh, I think that this, this the, the uh, the complexity of this has highlighted similar issues across the system that we have seen in terms of neurology, in terms of SAI processes, and in terms of joint protocols, that there is a difficulty here in terms of responding quickly and effectively to situations and communicating properly and openly with families in a timely way, that families aren't having to constantly go and dig out information, sometimes hearing it in the press, and that has happened in, in Muckamore, and that's totally unacceptable. That, that piece of it you know, should, be, should be able to be dealt with. The finding in the leadership review that the Belfast Trust had, had appropriate governance structures in place, I, I actually find absurd, because governance should be about ironing out that human frailty. And we all, we all recognise that serious abuse has taken place in Muckamore, and the serious mistakes have been made. So therefore, the governance, to me, failed. And I think we need to, to uh, establish what, what happened and what caused that failure. Um, I think it's also, and it has been mentioned here earlier, the fact that, that the uh, learning review has not spoken to some of the key people who are involved here is absolutely a major issue that needs to be addressed by way of, by way of a public inquiry. Um, I think families here have carried this burden. They have fought a lone, a lone battle. They have, spoke, they have spoke for their children. And I would simply call on, on the Minister, families have waited long enough. Please, and I would appeal to you, give them the public uh, inquiry that they deserve and the inquiry that the system needs in order to improve learning for the future. Gormay. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to support the motion and the amendment and thank uh, the members for bringing this uh, very important subject to the House today. I'm sure, like all members here today, uh, my thoughts are first and foremost with the families who the words Muckamore Abbey Hospital bring heart to pain and a sense of betrayal of trust. We speak as those who have been informed of only some of what has happened in that place, but without that personal connection. My deep sense of anger can count as nothing when I think of the emotions the families must feel today and every day. Mr Deputy Speaker, Muckamore represents the failure of a system of personal accountability and leadership 
and duty of care that society has for those who suffered. I am still absolutely astounded by the sheer scale of what we are dealing with in this one hospital. This is the largest adult safeguarding case in the entire United Kingdom. I am still um, horrified by events as they have happened. The PSNI have identified some 1,500 separate criminal cases for investigation with a timeline of around five years for that process to conclude. Institutional abuse was investigated back in 2012, but steps were not taken, and this allegedly resulted in further harm to other vulnerable patients. The cases of physical and mental abuse were not isolated. It was not the actions of a lone worker. It was systematic in scale. Here we had the supposed sanctuary for adults with learning difficulties, where they suffered personal torment by being physically abused and assaulted by nursing staff. It is a scandal, and as such I see no other appropriate mechanism by which to investigate it other than by a public inquiry. I do, however, welcome the commitment given by the Health Minister last month that he does intend to create an inquiry. But it is the shape of such an inquiry and the powers available to it that are fundamental to its credibility and the weight of its investigation. And that is why we are backing today's motion. A public inquiry is essential. Nothing less will do. And I urge the Minister to press ahead on that basis. Witnesses and evidence must be compelable with no place to hide in the quest for truth, for justice and learning from this horrendous case. I recognise the caution around allowing the police to investigations to conclude, but Mr Deputy Speaker, five years is too long for families to wait. I believe that the families should be at the centre of any discussion around the form that that inquiry takes. This is about getting those affected truth first and foremost, but it's also about the uh, ensuring that no other family faces anything like what happened here in any other place within our health system. We have been able to learn much from the review and subsequent report commissioned by the Department and which reported last month. The record of the Belfast Trust and its handling of Muckamore is nothing short of shameful. We have seen nurses have their suspensions overturned without the Belfast Trust having provided the evidence and the CCTV to the Nursing and Midwifery Council. We have had senior managers refusing to cooperate with the internal governance review. We have seen trust officials admitting delays in reporting of incidents from staff management and onward referrals. It is unacceptable for senior management at Belfast Trust to say they were unaware of the issues at Muckamore. Why should a family have to rely on freedom of information requests to establish whether risk assessments have been carried out um, on their loved one's care? Why is candor so hard to find? Why have the Trust adopted a closed, defensive, dishonourable stance with families? Such behaviour, coupled with the scale and seriousness of the alleged abuse and failings in governance, makes the case for a full public inquiry irrefutable. <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, what we all want is the truth, and what we want is those responsible held to account and brought to justice. So with that, we support the motion and the amendment placed before us today. Thank you. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise today in support um, of the motion and the amendment um, to say that for the SDLP, should today's motions pass, that nothing less than a full and independent public inquiry into the systemic failures uh, of leadership and governance at Muckamore Abbey Hospital will be sufficient. The findings of the review um, into the governance and leadership at Muckamore Abbey make for some of the most disturbing and heart-wrenching reading that I have ever encountered in as long as I can remember. They were a moment of the most abject shame and disgrace for us. The review revealed institutional abuse of the most indefensible nature, uh, discarding basic human dignity and some of the most vulnerable members of our society. It revealed a systemic failure on the part of the Belfast Trust uh, and Health and Social Care Board. Furthermore, it raised major concerns into how previous health ministers within the executive uh, did not have Muckamore on their agenda and did not challenge uh, the happenings within the hospital. Mr Speaker, it is clear from reading the report too uh, that for too long Muckamore was regarded as something that just wasn't talked about and that it operated just under the radar um, and that the directors and managers were able to operate with autonomy. Uh, with a culture of settling matters on site and who had loyalty to each other and not to the trust, never mind the patients that they were caring for. 
This is a, a monumental scandal, as has been referenced. And what is all the more galling is that the investigations were launched almost eight years ago and were not escalated to the executive team or trust board. That we may never know the full scale of the abuse that took place at Mockamore um, as CCTV recordings were only installed in 2012 and older recordings were overwritten will only cause further outrage and justified righteous anger. Mr Deputy Speaker, we need to get to the root of this disgrace and hence why the Health Minister must now begin proceedings to open a full, independent and public inquiry into the leadership and the governance at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. We know that there were retired members of staff who did not respond to the review team, and that is not good enough. Witnesses must be compelled to bring forward their evidence. Uh, all previous health ministers from 2012, some of whom are still MLAs today, must give an account of how marginally Muckamore was on their agenda. Our health service failed the residents of the hospital for too long. It is time to bring the truth to light. And while this may be uncomfortable uh, for many, it is critical that we get to the truth and that we get the full facts and all of the information to determine how such events cannot happen ever again. I and my colleagues within the SDLP will not rest until their story is told, uh, that their truth is spoken and acknowledged, and they receive the satisfaction that they deserve. I support the motion and the amendment today and sincerely hope all right-thinking and compassionate members will do so as well. Thank you. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, no words of condemnation are strong enough for what is alleged to have happened in Muckamore Abbey Hospital. Patients, many of whom were the most vulnerable in Northern Ireland, were failed. They were allegedly abused. Patients were allegedly verbally and physically assaulted. They were treated as if somehow they weren't equal citizens, and somehow it was all inflicted on them by fellow human beings, people who were charged with both the privilege and responsibility of caring for them. It was disgusting. Regrettably, it could unfairly compromise the reputation of all those professionals who on a daily basis provide dedicated and loving care for the most vulnerable in our community. Muckamore Abbey Hospital should have been a place of safety. It should have been a therapeutic place patients could have went for loving support and care. And whilst I suspect that over the years some patients did receive exemplar treatment, unfortunately the shocking scale of abuse subsequently revealed has understandably overshadowed all that. As the Deputy Speaker has cautioned, we should remain especially careful as there is a live police investigation underway. So it's important that we let it take its course. However, there are many, many other unanswered questions in relation to Muckamore. How did it happen? How could staff who were trained to look after vulnerable patients cruelly inflict such harm and distress on the very same people? How was it allowed to go on for so long? And how did the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust seemingly not know what was going on? Those are four basic questions that the Muckamore patients and families deserve answers to. And just as importantly, we all need assurances that such depravity will never be allowed to happen again. While the abuse came to light in September 2017 with a game-changing discovery of the CCTV recordings, there were earlier warning signs. The Innes safeguarding investigation, a full five years earlier, should have been enough to raise concerns, but time after time opportunities were missed and the abuse was allowed to go on. Whilst the responsibility of any abuse should always rest foremost with individuals inflicting it, there was also clearly a systemic failure in the leadership, management and governance of the facility. I noted the publication of the report into that particular issue last month. And whilst the findings don't make for pleasant readings, I was glad that the Minister once again affirmed his intention to hold an inquiry. I also welcome the sensible approach he has adopted since coming into office. He has avoided any knee-jerk decision or statements on an issue that warrants the utmost attention and consideration. He said he would visit Muckamore. He did. He said he had engaged with the families. He did. And it's the families and patients that should remain to the foremost 
forefront of our minds. This shouldn't be a party issue. All political parties should be equally as disgusted at what happened at Muckamore, and all parties, I suspect, have as equally a strong appetite to get answers as to how and why it happened in the first place. Those answers won't be easy, and there may be more difficult revelations ahead, but if we are to ensure it never happens again, we need total truth and transparency in relation to what took place on the wards of this hospital. I recall an elderly and frail widow I knew well who devoted her life to lovingly caring for her severely disabled adult son. He depended on her for every aspect of his day-to-day -day care. Just before her death, she had to commit her son into the care of Muckamore Hospital. She died reassured that her son would receive the same care and attention she had lavished on him. That poor lady would spin in her grave if she knew the potential for her son to have become a victim, to have become a punch ball for some sadistic person who was supposed to supply care. This poor man could not have resisted nor articulate the treatment he may have been receiving. I wish the harrowing police inquiries well, and my party fully support a timely public inquiry into this dreadful scandal. We owe it to the patients and their families and to those family carers like the widow I have mentioned who are no longer with us to provide answers, to hold those guilty of any criminal offences to account and ensure that such a shameful episode never happens again. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Trevor Clark. Um, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the members who laid this motion and indeed the amendment, and we will be supporting both, as has been previously said by my party colleague. I think it was one of the words that uh, the move of the motion struck me the most was out of sight, out of mind. And I think for many of us, that's what this seems to be. Um, in relation to the families, I mean, we all support the families in relation to this, and indeed the staff, many of the staff who are innocent and carrying out an excellent job, and I think sometimes that is lost. Um, because there's this blanket approach in terms of the staff, but there's many excellent staff there who will continue to work, and I know we will all agree with that. And indeed, I feel for the police also, who are now used, um, because they're being called there more often, because the staff are cautious about what actions they can take against those vulnerable patients. So I know that the local police are there more frequently than they would like to be, because they're being used more frequently uh, to protect, in a sense, to protect the staff and to, to prevent them from getting into any further danger, given some of the historic nature of what has been said previously. There, there is a historic case, and I know I have had the opportunity at the policing board to raise this with the police, and I've heard about the hours and hours of tape. So I'm confident that the police will get to the bottom of that in release an investigation, and I'm not going to touch that, as the Speaker has said. Indeed, we only heard yesterday about another uh, arrest in relation to that. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean someone is guilty, but it's part of an investigation. But I'm just listening to the previous Speaker when he talked about the woman who placed her son in care, and now he should be spinning her grave. I want to talk about a family who the grandmother is still very much alive and well. The mother and father are very much alive and well, who visited their son on a weekly basis. But unfortunately for me, and I think this is where the amendment touches it better for me today, where it talks about the current delivery of services. I mean, we can focus on the past and we can focus about the things that we know, but let's focus on the future and let's focus on today. So I have a family who would have went down and visited the young fellow in his 20s every week. This young fellow, if you picture him, he's over six foot tall and they had the best of clothes and the family were bringing him clothes on a regular basis. But to come down on a Friday afternoon to see him clothes that were unfit for him to wear were too small. So this wasn't years ago, this was months ago. This is, this is today, this is what's happening. So they would come down and see their son in clothes that were unfit. They went through a period of times where he wasn't lucid. So the family came to myself and indeed I think he approached other elected representatives and, uh, as well for support. And this for me, in terms of the contact and the trust and the responsibility of the trust also, how difficult they made that for elected representatives to support families. First off, you needed your consent form. So this young fellow was in here, so the mother signed the consent, thought that was adequate. The trust said, no, it needs to be the patient. The patient signs the form. The trust came back and said, no, the patient wouldn't have known what he's signing. So everything the trust could do to make it obstructive, to prevent anyone supporting that family, they done it. But eventually, thankfully, the trust did have a meeting. 
and we, we went through various aspects of the care that that young fellow was getting. And they changed his care, and the young fellow was more lucid and was fit to cooperate with the family. Roll on to a few months ago, we're taking steps backwards. The family contact the hospital, no, he's sleeping in the middle of the day. They arrive down, no, he's sleeping. Will they let him down to the room to see them? No, they don't. The family can't get to that room to see their son. This young fella is in his 20s, so he's not, he's not and he has no mental, uh, I, suppose, I suppose he has an issue that he's there, but prior to his involvement or what he, his problem, he was fairly lucid with his, his parents. I mean, indeed, I've been there and met him and could hold a conversation with the young fella. But the suspicion grows with families whenever they can't meet their family. So how come, when is the best time to go and see your son? Do you go during the day when he's in bed? Do you go at night? Do you ring? But on every occasion, they could never get to see him. Only a few weeks ago, the father arrived on another visit to see his son being handled in a manner physically restrained, which was disturbing to him and actually questionable. He raised a complaint on that occasion. The member of staff was removed. Roll on another few weeks. That member of staff's back in the ward, but the family and the father has never been updated. So for me today, members, in relation to the motion, I support the motion, I support the amendment, and in particular the delivery of services currently, because I'm confident, and I have to say in appreciation to the Minister, the Minister has said all the Member right George things to pass, and I appreciate what the Minister has said in relation to that, and I'm confident the measure, Minister will take whatever action is necessary to bring this to a close. I call Minister McHugh. Uh, and uh, I'm privileged to uh, speak on this motion today as well and support of the motion in every respect. Uh, that, like other members here in the chamber, and that I'm totally outraged uh, at what it is that has happened in Muckamore. But more particularly, you know, that that outrage in itself isn't as, just as a result of all of the incidents and that, that have happened, we'll say, within Muckamore itself, but in particular, uh, the experiences and that of families, whenever uh, it was revealed what it was that was happening in Muckamore, and whenever they attempted to uh, raise the questions and the issues in and around that, uh, the experience just of the inherent resistance, not only with the Belfast Trust, but also within the wider health and social care system to be open, to be transparent, and to answer some of the basic questions around the quality of care of families much the same issue as was alluded to just by the previous speaker as well. It's also worth noting that Muckamore Abbey Hospital is a regional facility and is part of a regional pathway of care for the assessment, treatment and support of those with learning difficulties. Yet such abuses occurred. And I know that some of my colleagues have spent a considerable amount of time engaging with the relevant bodies and agencies to try to get to the centre of this. Indeed, my colleague, uh, Colin Gildenew, has named just a few of the organisations, and I believe that highlights the need for such an inquiry that is both um, uh, necessary uh, and, and important and that will help to identify not only the individual failings but the wider systematic failings and the culture even that existed uh, within that particular provision. And I note that uh, the motion in itself it makes reference to leadership and governance review. However, uh, just again to uh, in an article in the Irish News today where they uh, alluded to um, a comment being made as a result of an independent review that uh, it was found that there was a, a, Muckamore was a place apart, managed by a dysfunctional team who missed opportunities to prevent abuse identified years previously. Now, that in itself is a very, very damning statement in every respect. And as a result of that, again, too, I come back uh, to the very point that uh, when the question was put by Pat Sheehan, uh, uh, another party member, to the Minister of Health, he stated that I have sought detailed advice in relation to an inquiry. Further advice has still been received. I also need to ensure that any process that is put in place does not interfere with the current PSNI criminal investigations. 
Now, can the minister, and this is my question to the minister, can he provide some clarity as to whether further detail, what further details is he seeking? Because, again, too, it has already been stated in this chamber that, in fact, uh, that type of public inquiry, which is so necessary, and we all can identify that, that it does not interfere with uh, the police investigation uh, running concurrently. So I ask the minister uh, that who he has asked in terms of those details uh, and when does he expect some answers. And finally, just I would like to actually make the point as well too, that it is so important that in the event of uh, this inquiry happening, that all of the people, i.e. the staff and that that work within Muckamore, because at the end of the day too, I know, as we all know, there are many, many uh, good members of staff within Muckamore, that they're all given their opportunity as well to, as is the families, uh, the residents and the staff that work within that facility, uh, to be open, transparent and honest about what it is that has happened within that provision. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion and the amendment and thank the members for bringing that forward. Mr Deputy Speaker, the PSNI and the health authorities are still currently investigating allegations that vulnerable patients were physically and mentally abused by staff at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. Muckamore Abbey Hospital is on the outskirts of Antrim, is run by the Belfast Trust and is providing facilities for adults with severe learning disabilities and mental health needs. As allegations of abuse began to emerge, a number of people have been arrested and staff have been suspended from their jobs. The PSNI said it was working with the Trust on an investigation into the allegations and Detective Chief Inspector Duffy said police were examining a series of very traumatic events seen in more than 300,000 hours of CCTV footage. It is clear from some of the evidence that vulnerable patients were assaulted by staff at Muckamore Abbey Hospital between 2014 and 17. CCTV footage revealed 1,500 crimes on one ward alone which is extremely serious. CCTV footage from the psychiatric intensive care unit showed a patient being punched in the stomach by a nurse. That's just truly shocking. The footage taken over a three month period also showed patients being pulled, hit, punched, flicked and verbally abused by nursing staff. The Belfast Trust confirmed that at Muckamore between 2014 and 17, there has been more than 50 reported assaults on patients by staff. The chair of the Northern Ireland Biggest Review into Mental Health Services, Professor Roy McClellan, said that the allegations emerging from Muckamore could be the tip of the iceberg. Professor Roy McClelland, who led the 2017 seven, sorry, Bamford Review, also said that it was just a matter this is not just a matter of bad apples in a barrel. The then chief executive of the Belfast Trust, Martin Dillon, said some of the care failings in Muckamore are a source of shame but my primary focus is on putting things right. The Northern Ireland Health Regulator took action against the Belfast Trust over standards of care at Muckamore. Three enforcement notices were issued by the Regulatory and Quality Improvement Authority over staffing and nurse provision, adult safeguarding and patient finances. Then Northern Ireland Secretary of State Julian Smith apologised for the pain caused to families by the situation at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. Mr Smith then agreed to look into the matter further and to take advice about ordering a public inquiry. Dr Flynn, co-author of a damning review into Muckamore, said of the 23rd of January this year, the hospital needs to close. In her damning 2018 report, she identifies a series of catastrophic failings and found that patients' lives had been compromised. Dr Flynn said Muckamore residents had been manhandled and slapped on some occasions, and she was dis disappointed that the facility was still open. It is revealed that the Belfast Trust has spent four million on agency staff in order to cover vacancies at Muckamore because so, member so many members of staff have been suspended during this abuse probe. The Belfast Trust has confirmed that 40 employees have been placed on precautionary suspension while investigations continue. In addition, so far, five people have been arrested and questioned about ill treatment of patients. That's how serious this is. Northern Ireland's health regula regulator announced the results of the three-day unannounced inspection of Muckamore, including an overnight visit. 
The RQI inspection finds that there has been significant improvements, but it still has concerns about financial governance and safeguarding arrangements. Muckamore patients' families who have met the Health Minister Robin Swan following the restoration of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, at that meeting, uh, Glenn Brown, representative from the campaign group Action for Muckamore, said he was disappointed that Mr Swan could not give them assurances that a full public inquiry would take place. Minister, in light of the serious and extent of what has been going on at Muckamore, um, on this occasion that's not acceptable, and I know you have said about supporting um, uh, a public inquiry um, in the past. Um, and it is my view that no more reviews and no more queries. It just has to be a full public independent inquiry. Nothing else will do or suffice. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, there must be a public inquiry. Uh, nothing more or nothing less will do. And I support the motion and the amendment. Thank you. I call Mark Durgan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's now three years since the wide-scale abuse that took place at Muckamore Abbey Hospital came to light, and the intervening years, intervening years have not diminished the horror of the events that have been recounted here today. In fact, they have only made the need for accountability and justice more acute. The very people entrusted to care for vulnerable residents dehumanised them and abused the trust residents and their families put in them. Any individual who subjects a vulnerable adult or any vulnerable individual who rely on them to attacks and mental abuse is despicable. But they were enabled to do so by the Belfast Trust's oversight failures. The depth of violation and distress they have suffered is unimaginable. I have said in the past that this should prompt a wider review of the safeguarding system across our health and social care sector, so I am extremely alarmed by a more recent report of a safeguarding incident just in July of this year in Muckamore. We should be under no illusion that this is purely an historic issue, a point also made by Mr Clark. Apologies for the failures that allowed this institutional abuse and cruelty to take hold have certainly been forthcoming. And I very much welcome the Minister's apology in August when the departmental review was published, and I note his intention to set up an inquiry. I do not doubt his commitment on this at all and commend him for doing his best to get to grips with this in the midst of the pandemic, dominating his and officials' time and efforts. But I would urge him to take the next step and establish a public inquiry under the 2005 Act as the families have consistently called for. The SDLP has always taken our lead from the families, and I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to them for the dedicated and dignified work, striving to secure truth and accountability, and trying to ensure that no other family is subject to what they and their loved ones have been subjected to. Their calls for a public inquiry have our full support. The terrible abuse at Muckamore has led to the biggest criminal safeguarding investigation we have ever seen in Northern Ireland. That this would not be complemented by a public inquiry is, to my mind, frankly bizarre. The departmental review makes for devastating reading. A place apart that operated, and I quote again, outside the sightlines and under the radar of the Trust. Recognition, I am sure, the families would welcome, but the report also reveals that the since retired staff member who could shed some light on the CCTV issues did not respond to the review team's request to meet. Only a public inquiry could compel witnesses to attend to gather all of the evidence needed for thorough investigation and recommendations. This scandal has not only uncovered the shameful systemic abuse of some of our most vulnerable citizens, it has rocked confidence, shattered confidence in our whole care system. What is more, only a public inquiry can provide the independence and authority that are a prerequisite for the residents and their families to trust in its proceedings and findings. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister rightly said last month that families deserve answers. Today, they are still waiting for those answers. A public inquiry is now the only credible means left to secure the accountability and scrutiny this scandal demands. I urge the Minister to commit to that full public inquiry and, if he cannot, to explain why he would resist it. I support the motion and the amendment. Members, the business committee is arranged to meet at one o'clock today. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting until two o'clock. The first items of business when we return will be question time, and this debate will then resume after question time when the next speaker will be Stuart Dixon. The sitting is, by leave, suspended. We now return to the debate on the public inquiry into Muckamore Abbey Hospital, and I call Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And I, I rise to support the, the motion uh, in my party colleague's name. Uh, and that I want to place on record my thanks to both of them uh, for bringing this important issue uh, to the House. When people are under the care of our health and social care system, they should expect the highest quality of safe care, and they should be treated with the utmost respect and dignity. It is clear for so many vulnerable patients at Muckamore Abbey that this high quality of care was not being delivered. Indeed, there are criminal investigations ongoing, and patients and families have understandably lost confidence in the system. I want to pay tribute to those patients and families who have campaigned on this matter. They definitely deserve justice. It's for this reason that nothing short of a public inquiry will do. The Health Minister has already issued an apology, but that is not enough. The failings in this respect are systemic. In the interim, we need to be fully implementing the changes to address the failings, including the leadership and governance review, as mentioned by the proposed amendment. We need a bespoke plan to rebuild confidence in the services, and in the interim, I am very happy to support this. Just very briefly, Mr Speaker, I want to reference back to a comment that was made by, I think, Mr Clark earlier on about concern that over many years, there were many in the community who were not happy about uh, residents from Muckamore Abbey coming into the community. I believe that that couldn't be further from the truth. As far back as 1984, I had the privilege to be on the board of Kilcreggan Homes, Carrick Fergus, which now is Kilcreggan Urban Farm. Under the inspiring leadership of Oliver and Amanda Shanks, uh, two uh, doctors who were at that time long, they're now long retired, were involved in work in Muckamore Abbey, saw the urgent need to help residents there come into the community and be part of the community. Yeah. The member for Giving Way, maybe more for a point of clarification, and I actually think it's before he came to the House a number of years ago. Indeed, his party colleagues spoke on the matter in support of the very point he's making, as did I, as did the Minister of the time. The point I was making, whenever there was resettlement for some of these people within the community, and when the planning applications were going through the system, there was some political representatives who were putting up opposition to prevent these people from coming in within the community. But his party colleague at the time, David Ford, did speak in favour of. The members, next a minute. Much, and I do appreciate that. Yes, Mr Speaker, as far back as 1984, when Craig and Homes were coming into existence, there was community consultation and a wonderful warm welcome for residents who uh, Oliver and Amanda Shanks were working with in Muckamore Abbey to integrate them into the community. And today we have a wonderful and vibrant community in Carrick Fergus known as Kilcreg and Urban Farm. For too long, Muckamore Abbey um, operated without the appropriate proper oversight or leadership. In fact, the review into leadership and government stated that the leadership was dysfunctional and the hospital operated outside the sight lines and under the radar of the trust. Sadly, we have seen that on many occasions in other parts of the United Kingdom in similar institutions. I suppose, sadly, on reflection, um, the reality was something like that was also going to happen and was happening here.
We have seen too many horror stories of institutions like this in other parts of the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, hire people to be truly assured that health and social care for some of the most vulnerable in our society is safe unless an independent and full public inquiry assesses what went wrong, sets out the standards that are now required and, and imposes the appropriate reform in the system. We need that to happen and we need that to happen without delay. And that is why I'm supporting both the motion and the amendment today. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I call Pat Cackney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sorry. Uh, thank you. I'm sure I'm not the only MLA who's lay awake at night, horrified at the stories my constituents have told me about the scale of the problems at Muckamore Abbey. The independent report makes grim reading of the systematic issues within the department. Trust and the hospital. I know the minister has had a lot on his plate over the last few months, but the recommendations must be implemented as soon as possible, so this starts and will never happen again. Specifically, we need to support the frontline staff. The report makes reference to staff feeling disconnected and unsupported. This cannot happen in a high-risk environment like Muckamore. To do so puts everyone at risk. It is a cultural problem that needs change now. The lack of learning from the data is a massive concern. We cannot treat reporting as a tick box exercise. We need to be constantly evaluating, learning from our mistakes and doing the best to improve for all our patients. The Trust needs to act now to have accountability for directors and senior management. No one can be above scrutiny. The Trust needs to immediately put plans in motion on how they are going to do this. And I have no doubt that our present Minister will see, that, will see this through. Most importantly, the victims and the families of victims must know that we are taking this issue seriously. A lot of the problems come out in the independent inquiry, but the only way to get all the information so all the problems can be dealt with is a full and public inquiry. Now is the time to act, now is the time to implement change, and now is the time to tell all the victims and all the families of victims that this will never happen again. I support the motion and the counter motion is given. Thank you. I call Steve Aiken. Deputy Speaker, and my, I will keep my remarks uh, short. Um, as, a, as a member of the MLA for, as MLA for South Antrim, I have many of my constituents who are families, patients, and indeed staff at Muckamore Abbey. And Muckamore Abbey and the staff and the patients and the families have been very badly let down by the lack of responsibility, lack of accountability and the lack of oversight that should have been the basic function of the Belfast Trust going forward. We in the Ulster Unionist Party will be supporting this motion and the amendment, but we need to see action. And indeed, for the future of those patients there and the staff there at Muckamore Abbey, they need to see some restoration in trust. And that restoration can come through the leadership of our Health Minister, who has been doing a sterling job so far. Thank you. And I call Jerry Carl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I want to thank the, the members uh, for bringing the, the motion and the amendment uh, today. Uh, quite uh, uh, normally and quite rightly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a lot of time has been spent in this chamber discussing COVID-19 and its impact uh, on our communities. But we cannot lose sight uh, of all the other issues that have faced uh, those people who need and rely upon our, our health service. Uh, and quite rightly, during the COVID-19 period, we talked about the need to protect those. Uh, who are vulnerable in our society. Uh, we should apply that same principle, I believe, to those patients of Muckamore, the neurology inquiry, and all patients who are seeking uh, answers to mistreatment uh, or alleged uh, miscarriages uh, of justice. If the health service uh, does not work for, for these people, uh, who are the most vulnerable or unwell, uh, can we really say that it works properly at all if it does not work uh, for these uh, communities? And whilst we uh, resolutely must support uh, these communities who are battling for answers uh, and justice, we have to ensure that another Muckamore uh, does not happen ever again. And can we really rule it out, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker? Uh, from happening again if our health service is so uh, understaffed, 
and under-resourced. I hope, I sincerely hope it doesn't happen again, uh, and I want to ensure uh, that all action is taken now uh, to prevent it from happening uh, again. And, and I am concerned, uh, like the Chair of the Health Committee earlier, about the over-reliance on agency staff uh, within the care sector uh, and within our health service uh, generally, where people are unable uh, to develop relationships with, with patients. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this, uh, this issue shouldn't be about workers versus patients, but about patients and their families up against uh, an unfair system or a system that uh, didn't uh, take their concerns uh, seriously. One of the most alarming aspects uh, uh, to this investigation at, Mark at Markmore is that the Belfast Trust um, decided in 2015, two years before the alleged abuse, to install CCTV cameras because in uh, 2015 the numbers of adult uh, safeguarding investigations were so uh, were far too high. Uh, the decision to install uh, CCTV in 2015 was considered uh, to be a way to uh, protect the vulnerable adults. And if the reports uh, were true then, it would appear that the abuse soared after uh, the CCTV uh, was installed. I think I have to ask the question, how is that even possible? Uh, and the recent Mark and review uh, into leadership and governance at the Belfast Trust seems to portray uh, the CCTV operation as a complete uh, fiasco. I can't uh, describe it as anything but. Uh, it would appear that nobody knew for over a year that the CCTV cameras were even turned on. Uh, and if we cannot trust people, uh, or if people don't know whether the cameras are turned on uh, in hospitals and care settings, uh, are they really fit to play a leading role in delivering health uh, and care services? These are serious questions which need answered. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the RQIA um, held five serious uh, concern meetings with the Belfast Trust about Mock and Moore between 2014 and uh, 2016. How then was it possible for alleged large-scale abuse to take place the following year in 2017? It would appear to me uh, from this course of events that either no action was taken or limited action at best was taken to prevent uh, abuse from uh, reoccurring potentially. Um, so I would like to ask the Minister or uh, somebody who can uh, answer this question what happened uh, in that two-year period. Um, Shawnee Graham, Mr Deputy Speaker, from the Irish News reported uh, that it's costing millions to staff um, Muckamore because of so many staff have been uh, suspended pending uh, investigation. This is obviously quite shocking and quite worrying. Uh, but I would ask the Minister directly, um, what about uh, senior staff at the Belfast Trust? Uh, have any been suspended or sacked? Or is there any ongoing plans or investigations in, in regards to that uh, matter? Same with Board of Directors, Chief Executives and so on. Uh, this is a very serious scandal, as everybody has said today. And some would argue that it's uh, more serious than RHI, and we, we should treat it uh, as such. Um, and whilst over uh, the last few days we heard the Chief Medical Officer was visiting bars at the weekend uh, in his own time um, to ensure COVID restri restrictions were maintained, many would ponder why the Chief Medical Officer and other senior health staff didn't make spot check visits uh, to care settings to potentially flag up uh, these issues. So I think it's important to note. Member draws remarks to close. I will do. I think it's important to say that um, uh, our party uh, backed the uh, uh, call for a public inquiry to ask what happened and why it happened for so long. We commend those who have campaigned to highlight and to fight for justice. Thank you. I now call on the Health Minister, Robin Swan, to respond to the debate. Um, um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to take the opportunity today to announce that I am calling a public inquiry under the Inquiries Act 2005 into the abuse at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. This is not, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, how I had planned to make the announcement. Uh, I had wanted to communicate my decision to families and patients, both current and former, before I announced it publicly. However, because of the Assembly motion being called for today and not wanting to have been accused of withholding important information or my decision from the House, that wasn't possible. So I want to apologise today to those families and patients um, that you are hearing about this now for the first time. It wasn't the way I wanted you to hear, but I acknowledge and respect this chamber and its members. I want to take this opportunity to once again put on record 
My apologies on behalf of the health and social care system to patients and families who have been let down by failure to protect patients from abuse. A shocking failure which has affected some of the most vulnerable members of our society who should be protected. But families and patients want and deserve more than apologies. They want and need answers as to why this happened and how it was allowed to happen. And I hope that the public inquiry that I have announced today will give them those answers. We have now had two reports into the events at Muckamore, the Serious Adverse Incident Report, and um, most recently the review into the leadership and governance of Muckamore Abbey Hospital. The recent report on the leadership and governance review does not hold back in stating very clearly that the Belfast Trust failed in its duty of care to those vulnerable adults, and I thank the review panel for their very frank assessment and conclusion. It highlights that while the Belfast Trust had appropriate corporate governance and leadership arrangements in place, they failed to prevent abuse, identify at the appropriate level that abuse had taken place, and adequately prevent further abuse from happening. The report concludes that these failures resulted in harm to patients. A previous investigation into abuse was a missed opportunity. The Trust's focus on Muckamore, insofar that it had one, was on resettlement at the expense of ensuring safe, high-quality care for those who remained in hospital. That should never have been the case. Even though the Trust installed CCTV in the hospital and entered into a contract for its ongoing maintenance, no one appears to have been aware that these cameras were operational. Footage was recorded, stored and even deleted without anyone looking at the images. Indeed, they only reviewed this material following the persistence of a parent who was desperate to get to the bottom of what had happened to his son. When the Trust finally did look at the images from the CCTV, they revealed thousands of incidents of poor practice and the abuse of the most vulnerable in our society. The fact that this situation was able to arise is probably indicative of another conclusion of the Leadership and Governance Review. The report also found that for years, at the top of the Belfast Trust, there was scant evidence of any corporate curiosity about the facility. It did not feature in the Trust annual reports, and it was not regularly visited by board members. Despite being the largest facility of its kind in the region, despite it being widely known that this type of facility carries an inherent risk of abuse, given the vulnerability of its patients, it was not in their line of sight. It was, as members have reported, a place apart from the rest of the Trust. When this lack of interest collided with the failure of managers in Muckamore to escalate issues, a perfect storm was created, whereby abuse was able to go unchecked. Mr Deputy Speaker, I cannot find words to adequately describe the scale of this betrayal of trust, this scandal. Members will be aware that whilst I was leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, I backed calls for a public inquiry into the appalling allegations of abuse. I signed the letter at that stage. I believed the public inquiry was the only outcome. And whilst my opinion did not change, from coming into this office on the 11th of January this year, I made it clear that whatever decision I was going to ultimately take as Minister would be informed by the views of the people who use the services at Muckamore and their families. That is why I visited the hospital on the 22nd of January and met with patients, families, carers and staff to hear from them as early as possible. I also met with the Action for Muckamore group on the 17th of February. I said I wanted to wait to see the findings of the report of the Leadership and Governance Review, which was due at the end of June, before I made my decision. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, um, this report was delayed until the 5th of August. But now we have this report. And I confirmed on the 5th of August that it was my clear intention 
to establish an inquiry, but that I would take time to consider the report in detail, to establish what questions remain unanswered, and to consider all the options available for an inquiry going forward. Since then, I have read the report, and I was appalled. And for the record, I can confirm that I accept all the recommendations in the report and will progress them as a matter of urgency. My officials examined the findings of the report and provided me with their advice last week. After considering their advice, the only option I could see to get the answers everyone is seeking is a statutory public inquiry. And as I have outlined already, I wanted to engage with families and patients at Muckamore on the best way forward and for them to be the first to hear of my decision. My officials have a programme of work to get this inquiry up and running. This is likely to, to take time. It is not work that can be rushed. Families and patients, both current and former, will have the opportunity to influence the terms of reference for this inquiry, and I will be in touch with arrangements for this. I can advise, however, that in anticipation of an inquiry, the Chief Social, Worker, Chief Social Work Officer and Chief Nursing Officer wrote to all HSC organisations and to staff in the department in early February. They were asked to take all necessary steps to preserve any documents, records and other relevant material relating to Muckamore Abbey Hospital and ensure that it is retained and not subject to scheduled disposal. I understand the demands of those who believe that a public statutory inquiry under the Inquiries Act 2005, with the powers to call witnesses and cross-examine them in public, is the only way to get the answers they need, particularly as some retired Belfast Trust managers did not engage with the Leadership and Governance Review. Mr Deputy Speaker, I just do not understand those demands. I agree with them. I am keen to ensure that we find a way to take forward an inquiry process which will address the unanswered questions and the crucial issues of how we ensure this never happens again. What led to a significant number of staff to either participate in or turn a blind eye to abuse of the very people they were employed to care for? Why did the systems design to identify and put a stop to abuse when it did happen, fail? And how could the leadership of the Belfast Trust go for so long without understanding the risks inherent in this type of facility? However, we also need to ensure that this process does not duplicate the work already taken forward by the external, independently led Level 3 Serious Adverse Incident Review and the Independent Leadership and Governance Review. We must also take account of the major police investigation, which is still ongoing, because I want to ensure that any process that is put in place does not jeopardise this investigation and allow those who deserve to be prosecuted for their crimes to be let off the hook. As I have said, the police investigation into the abuse at Muckle Moor is still ongoing and is likely to continue for some time. I understand that eight individuals who worked in Muckamore have been arrested, the most recent arrest only yesterday. Files on seven of these individuals have been submitted to the Public Prosecution Service to consider charges. To date, 62 members or former members of staff have been placed on precautionary suspension. I anticipate that there will be more arrests and more suspensions going forward. Mr Deputy Speaker, I understand that family, families and patients want to know what is planned for the future of Muckamore, and I can assure them that no decision has been made to close the hospital. Let me be very clear. The immediate priority for Muckamore remains the safety and stability of care provided there. There will continue to be a focus on resettlement but not at the expense of those who require to be in hospital. And when resettlement happens, it must always be for the betterment of the individual concerned and never 
to simply meet a target, no matter how well-intentioned that target might be. Looking to the long term, there is a clear need to transform services for adults with learning disabilities in Northern Ireland. And work is being taken forward through the transformation agenda to develop a new service model for learning disability services. The reshaping of services will cover different aspects of care, including inpatient assessment and treatment of patients with learning disabilities, respite care, outreach work to support community placements, and provision in circumstances where placements might break down. Identifying the best long-term location for inpatient and respite care will form part of the work. The best interests of patients will be the paramount consideration at all times, because any changes will be taken forward in detailed consultation with patients, their families and carers and staff. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a sad chapter in the history of the health and social care services in Northern Ireland, in particular both the Belfast Trust and Mockamore Abbey Hospital. They have failed in their duty to protect these patients. They have failed in their duty to the family members. This abuse should never have happened. And as Minister, I will do all that I can to make sure it never happens again. Mr Deputy Speaker, that is why I am announcing a statutory public inquiry into the events at Muckamore Abbey Hospital. Thank you. I call Orlea Flynn to wind on the amendment. Gormi Agut, alas, can call you. And firstly, um, of course, I would just like to warmly welcome um, the Minister's announcement um, that he has made, and also just to concur with comments that were made by numerous members throughout today's debate, um, that I do not see this motion as being contentious or as being party political. Um, and obviously, I want to thank Paula and John um, for bringing it to the floor today. Um, the motion and discussion today was um, all about the families. It is about all the families that have been fighting for truth and justice into how their loved ones were treated within the health and social care system. Uh, we can't forget that there are families and patients at the centre of this scandal who are simply trying to get to the truth of what's happened to their loved ones, their sons, daughters, brothers and sisters. And it's right that a shining light is cast into the quality of care and governance within not only within Muckamore Abbey Hospital, um, but as the minister um, as the minister said, within the wider health and social care system. I fully support um, the decision that's been made um, around a public inquiry to get to the truth. And hopefully this will make sure that nothing like this can ever happen again. And I'm fairly sure that the Minister will agree with me on this point, that no one, regardless of their condition, should ever have to call an acute hospital or award their home. Um, those who can live in the community must be fully supported to do so. And that means completing the programme of resettlement and building sustainable packages of care within our community. On the topic of community care, one of the first questions I asked of this mandate was into the number of admissions and discharges from the Muckamore Abbey Hospital. Um, at the time, I was concerned that the sustainability of care within the community was at breaking point. A package of care can be many things, but it's essentially about people and services. And when it breaks down, it can be for many reasons and many genu genuine reasons. However, it can also be because a family or a carer can no longer cope. And the stress and pressure this can have is devastating. I remember hearing the families at the centre of the abuse talking about the difficult choices that they had to make, hearing from families struggling to cope when things weren't working out, and particularly about the fear and the anxiety then of sending their loved ones onto a hospital that was at the centre of one of the largest safeguarding probes within these islands. And that is why I am still concerned around the sustainability and delivery of services within the Muckamore Abbey Hospital today. 
This does not take away from supporting the Muckamore Abbey families and their quest for answers and for justice, which I think we all fully support clearly. But it's about ensuring that going into the future, uh, the public have access to high quality, safe and reliable services, which support both staff and patients. Um, so I'll just finish again by welcoming the Minister's decision and I sincerely hope, as all the members have referenced throughout today's discussion, um, that this decision and this move will hopefully bring answers, closure, but more importantly, the meaningful change for the future. Gormila Mayogov. I now call John Blair to wind up the debate on the motion, and you'll have up to 10 minutes. Deputy Speaker, uh, thank you. I think I, I cannot start in any way other than to thank the Minister sincerely um, that, that he came here to make an announcement on the decision made and the action that he intends to take, and I'm sure uh, all members would join with me in, in thanking him for that. Um, I also want to thank my colleague pa Paula Bradshaw for bringing this motion before the Chamber in the first place and bringing me on board with it. And say in relation to the, to the very relevant points made in your speech earlier this afternoon and points raised by members also during the debate that I understand the huge amount of public concern surrounding this facility, which is based, as some members will know, in my own constituency and indeed there were other South Antrim members who spoke during the debate today. Before I respond, Deputy Speaker, on the points raised by members, and I thank them for, for their points, I shall briefly make a couple of observations and points myself, and they are relatively brief. Firstly, to draw members' attention to a very serious consequence of the outworkings of recent reviews, indeed other reviews, which the spiralling cost of the Muckamore abuse scandal revealed as millions of pounds which have been spent on keeping the hospital operational. At a reported cost to the health service, I should say, of £12 million, uh, corporate and issues around suspended staff, agent pay and agency nurses, sick leave at Muckamore Abbey, and a list that, that indeed is much longer than that. Um, th these costs are rising to £12 million out of what we can only term as an abuse scandal, which broke three years ago, is to the detriment of other public services, and crucially and specifically to the detriment of much-needed health service resource and facilities also. I don't think I need to remind members, or indeed Deputy Speaker the Minister, of that reality. Secondly, I would like to take the opportunity as a policing board member to commend the sterling work done by P the PSNI investigation team in relation to this matter for their extensive examination, separate to any health uh, and care-based reports, of course, which has involved hundreds of hours of CCTV footage. And I uh, know some of this through my membership of, of the policing board, and I should inform members that we have been updated there on a regular basis also. Um, I want to mention, finally, staff. Um, we are aware it's been mentioned here today that there are staff who have been continuing to do their jobs, shrouded in controversy, um, wary, wary of uh, suspicion, and it's, it's not good or, or positive or productive that any set of people are continuing to do uh, their tasks in, in those circumstances. I want now to, to respond to members, Deputy Speaker. I won't do it in detail, but I want to do it um, given the announcement events that have uh, kind of overtaken the debate. But I would like to do it in a way that um, brings out the cross-party consistency and cross-party concern um, expressed here today. And I'll, I'll do that by mentioning, first of all, the committee chair, Colin Gildernew, um, who highlighted clearly the plight of families and also meetings that he has had with police and others in relation to this. That was followed by comments from the uh, Health Committee Vice Chair, Pam Cameron, who referred also to families, the scale not only of the provision, but as well of the issue. Colin McGrath, on behalf of the SDLP, uh, then came in with the fact that the findings of reviews uh, were so disturbing. Trevor Clark spoke, as I mentioned before, as a South Andrew member. My colleague Stuart Dixon spoke of previous experience of good examples uh, about resettlement in the community. Steve Aiken spoke today as a party leader and before we had the announcement for the Minister expressed the support of his party for the motion from Paula and myself and for the amendment um, and we're grateful for that. Jerry, Car Jerry Carroll spoke um, towards the end of the debate and, and emphasised that we must do what we can to ensure that a similar set of circumstances do not arise again. 
And I think that those comments reflect broadly um, that we were justified in our call through the motion and the amendment for a public inquiry. Uh, today, the Minister has ensured that that will happen with the support of the House. I formally, of course, urge support for, for the uh, motion and the amendment. But before I close, I want to thank the Minister for his announcement today again um, that there is going to be a public inquiry and his acceptance as well of crucial report findings. We understand, Deputy Speaker, and respect that he came to the House to announce this inquiry. Uh, we know he would have done it in different circumstances. He might have done it differently in different circumstances, um, so that families, agencies, members here, and others were informed in order. But we are grateful for that, Deputy Speaker, and I urge support. Members, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Colin Gilgenu, Pat Sheehan, and Orlea Flynn be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I would ask members just to take their ease for a few moments before the uh, adjournment debate.